tonight, Luke chapter 2, and I uh, want to um, uh, be able to greet you t- this afternoon. Uh, I can't believe that Wednesday coming up is Christmas, amen? And uh, lo and behold, it's almost here and it's almost gone. And, uh, you know, a lot of preparation for Christmas and just seems that we just got through Thanksgiving and all of a sudden Christmas is about to bypass us all the way through, right? And uh, so uh, I I want you to know that uh, I've been struggling this year around Christmas time uh, and uh, it's just been the, the, the experience is is uh, sometimes, you know, I remember when being as a kid and, you know, you had a great joy uh, for Christmas and, and all of that, but it just seems that the older you get, it's harder to keep that joy, right? It's harder to keep that Christmas spirit, if you'd say. And, and uh, we, we could ask the question, what really is the Christmas spirit? Uh, is it giving? Uh, listen, just to be honest, Uh, Many of us spend hundreds of dollars in giving Christmas presents to our family. But what satisfaction does it really bring? Uh, We know that uh, if they either could they like the gift or they don't like the gift. And I remember growing up and uh, my grandmother spent her hard earned money buying us gifts. Right. And uh, for us as little kids, we were very unappreciated. (laughs) I didn't appreciate the things that my grandmother bought me until when I found out she wasn't going to give them no more, right? And, uh, you know, you just kind of, you know, get kind of all backwards, amen? And uh, today, uh, my grandmother's there in heaven, and yet I miss those little frivolous gifts that she gave, and uh, you could bank on it, you could count on it that every year you were going to get a pack of socks, amen? And now I miss those things, amen? Because I know that there's nothing greater than putting on a brand new pair of socks, amen? And uh, I I got to the point, you know, uh, when you wear your socks a lot and all of a sudden you begin to put them on and some don't feel right, it's uncomfortable. You turn the sock inside out and all kinds of fuzzies comes out of it and and uh, you don't know what else comes out of it, amen. Uh, but uh, things come out of it, and you just uh, get those things out of it. But uh, there's nothing like putting on a brand new pair of socks. You put them on, and it just ease on that comfort, amen. They stay up. You don't go throughout the day and always pull them up, amen. They stay up all day, and, and uh, I like that, amen. And uh, maybe I am a weird cookie, amen. Uh, but anyways, uh, I, I, I think about... Uh, what is the Christmas spirit? Amen. Uh, is it giving? Is it receiving? Well, and uh, we know that, uh, as I already may mention, there's often times that we receive things that we're just not grateful, right? Uh, think about the grace that God has given to us and how many times that we just simply take His grace for granted. Amen. And uh, we uh, say, well, I, I don't care what anybody says. I'm going to do it my way. And, uh, and uh, we're just ungrateful because God calls us to do it his way. And when we do it his way, well, it's so much sweeter. Eh? That, like that song goes, you know, uh, sweeter to know the name of Jesus, right? And uh, so tonight we're going to be looking into Luke chapter 2. I would invite you for the reading of the Word of God, Luke chapter 2, going to be reading verses 1 through 7. Uh, do keep the uh, church in prayer. Uh, uh, there is some uh, upcoming events that we're going to uh, behold. And uh, um, I think of the, uh, the leadership meeting that we're going to bring before all those that are in leadership. And uh, we want to be able to stretch forth what God has for us this coming year. And uh, it's going to take work. Amen. But I believe that we can work together and we can strive uh, to meet God's challenges, to meet those challenges uh, with his grace. Amen. And so tonight, let's look at Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, as we begin our Bible reading, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. 
and all went to be taxed, everyone in, uh, into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child, and so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that should be uh, uh, that she should be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight, dear God, in your sight. Lord, as we would ask tonight for your help, I pray, dear God, that you would uh, reveal unto us, Heavenly Father, uh, the conditions of our heart. We know, Heavenly Father, that in the world uh, they have made up their minds that they're going to choose uh, another God. And yet, Heavenly Father, we are in a world that we can be influenced by these other gods. And tonight, Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you would help us as your people, as those who have committed themselves unto the teachings and preaching of Jesus Christ, Lord, that we would be influenced not by other gods, but by our Lord Jesus Christ. And so tonight, Heavenly Father, we come before you. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would uh, be upon our hearts and our minds and be with those who are unable to attend with us tonight. In Jesus' name that we do pray, amen. Just real quick, as you're sitting down, I want you to continue to pray for Marie Massingale. Uh, I wanted to make mention of it this morning, uh, but she had had a blood clot, and uh, she has been on bed rest and went by and visited her yesterday. They were in hopes to let her go, but yet uh, they wanted to make sure before she goes that everything is reciting. So keep her in prayer. Uh, also, uh, Ms. Carter had traveled uh, to Grand Rapids, so keep her in prayer. A lot of folks are out uh, uh, being sick, and so we want to keep those in prayer. And I just want you to uh, keep our church uh, in, in prayer as far as we go through uh, this coming up year. So, so tonight we want to be looking in, and uh, uh, as we look into Luke, I want you to uh, take reading with me once again in verse 7. Because I'm going to bring out our title here tonight, uh, according to verse 7. The Bible says in verse 7, And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. I remember the first time when we had that little baby, a little baby boy, uh, little Josiah, and we wrapped him up. We didn't swallow him because I didn't know anything about swallowing him, amen? Uh, I, all I knew is to keep your hands off and it won't break, Amen? And uh, so uh, mama had to teach me how to swaddle uh, the baby. And, and I remember the uh, nurse coming in uh, oftentimes and uh, the nurse uh, wrapped the baby up so tight and it made it comfortable. And, and uh, uh, you know, we just, uh, what, a, what a precious time. Here we find uh, Jesus being sw uh, uh, swaddled and, and uh, wrapped up and swaddled in clothes. But notice in verse 7, as we continue looking into uh, our text tonight, and laid him uh, in a manger. What a tremendous uh, testimony that the children gave uh, for us today. A great illustration uh, of this babe uh, in the manger. But then also look with me. Notice where we're going to be pulling out of our text tonight. The Bible says, because there was no room for them in the end. Just in a few moments of time, I want to be able to uh, ask this question uh, among you. Uh, I know that tonight this is God's people, but I have to ask that question because it brings a reality. Uh, we want to be able to face 2020, but may I say to you that you can't face 2020 until you face this reality, and that is, is there any room for Christ? Uh, we think about today that uh, there was no room uh, for Christ. There was no room uh, at the very 
first time of Christmas, when all the things that uh, were there back in those days are still here today. I mean, we think about the Bethlehem star and how uh, that star shone so bright uh, that it was a testimony, uh, a, a, a prophetical testimony uh, that God keeps his promises. And I think about uh, that how today we celebrate the babe in the manger. And I think about the, all the representation of what Christmas really is. We have to ask that question. Is there any room for Christ? And we consider tonight that, uh, that Jesus came, and he came born into this world in preparation to die for man's sin. I don't understand everything that Jesus Christ did. And I, I, I wonder how, how much is there that we could truly understand to know the depths and the reality what Christ did for you and I on the cross. I don't think that uh, we can ever really truly get a fully grasp of what he did for us on the cross. I think that we have to go through in an eternity, a times in eternity, to understand what Jesus did for you and I. But I would say to you today that, uh, that as there was no room for Christ at his birth, there was no room for him in his death. He had to borrow a tomb uh, and being buried in that tomb. And we know that uh, he was buried in that tomb uh, for three days and three nights. And on that third day, he arose. Amen. Uh, I'm looking for, if the Lord tarries, I'm looking for that time that we can celebrate around Easter where we can shout and preach and proclaim that he is a live God. Amen. That he arose. I like that song, amen. He arose. He arose. Man, I tell you what, we need to uh, go around preaching that, that we're serving a risen Savior tonight. So I believe that tonight we can look into the, uh, this scene here as we're considering that in verse 7, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in the manger because there was no room for them in the end. I wonder tonight, what are some reasons why there was no room for Jesus in the end? Maybe tonight we could understand that it would be that uh, there was no room for Jesus uh, in the end because of man's ignorance. They did not even understand or even acknowledge that this was the Son of God in preparation of being born. I think about Mary and Joseph and how they certainly knew and understand, uh, understood that uh, the shepherds and the wise men and, and Anna and Simon and the temple and, and all these things that were taking place. And we know what the Bible says that Mary pondered all these things in her heart. And yet today we find that uh, it is still true today that uh, people do not know who Jesus is because of their own ignorance. They don't understand that he is, a, uh, he is uh, one that came from heaven and he preached and he made statements that, that he came from heaven to redeem man of their sin. And yet uh, we find that it is many of those who are ignorant about the Word of God. They are ignorant about who Jesus Christ is. And uh, I often uh, have been learning uh, as I become more mature in my faith that some of the greatest uh, 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 statements in the gospel uh, is where we find John 3, 16. The world understands this verse in a smidgen. They understand the Bible says, for God so loved the world. They understand that, to know that God loves them enough. They understand that his love is there unconditionally because they live in today in a, in a state that they're sinning and sinning, and yet they still believe that God loves them. How is it with the Christian? That when a Christian sins, they feel rejected. 
They feel that God is nowhere around. How many times that we can go to the altar and we can seek up for God and we can ask God forgiveness and, and we get up and we, uh, and we know that we prayed, we know that uh, we turn it over to the Lord, but yet we get up and we wonder, did God ever hear me? Has God ever heard my heart? Where is God in my life? And yet the world, they understand uh, that uh, for God so loved the world that he gave. And today the world is using that for their, own, uh, for their own reason. And today, I mean, it wasn't far from in October that I remember in October going to Home Depot that they had already had up Christmas arrangements. You say, what do you mean, preacher? I'm saying to you that tonight on one wall they had uh, arrangements up for Halloween. And up on the other wall they had arrangements for Christmas. Here's what I'm saying to you tonight. The world understands that there's a God in heaven who loves and gives, and yet they are living with this premises, and they're living in areas of their life that there's no change because they understand that God loves them, and that God gave. But we know the rest of the story. We know that those, as the Bible teaches, and, and, uh, and, and, and a lot of times we, uh, they, uh, the world stops at John 3, 16. And they stop there, and they're no, they know anything else about the Bible. You could go in a, uh, on a street corner, and you can preach for God's so love the world. You can preach John 3, 16. You can quote it uh, time and time again. And as you're quoting it, they're walking by, and they're quoting along with you. But anything else in the Bible, they don't understand. Because right after John 3, 16, the Bible says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Here's the definition. The world is on its way to hell knowing that God loves them. But in eternity, there's no hope for them. I don't know. If, if I was ever in that condition, i sure I was. I know I was because there was a time that I didn't even understand and didn't even acknowledge who Jesus Christ was. But what I'm saying to you today that the world is on their way to hell and there's no emphasis to understand why did Jesus Christ really come to this earth? Well, we find that according to verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. When you uh, uh, enlighten somebody in the Bible close to John 3, 16, and when you explain to them that there is a God in heaven uh, that loves them, they understand that. When you, and when you describe to them uh, that, uh, uh, that Jesus gave his life, they understand that. But how to comprehend that, they don't understand. And that's where you and I come in. Because the reason is uh, that me, uh, many, many times we find that the gospel is not getting out, is not reaching the hearts of the world because the ignorance of God's people. Is there any room for Christ is the question. And so we want to uh, understand that uh, Jesus has called you and I uh, to be uh, like an innkeeper, to know that, uh, that hey, uh, that the birth, the, uh, the second coming of Jesus Christ is coming. We ought to be proclaiming that. Let's move on. Another reason I believe that tonight, uh, that their, uh, as their innkeeper didn't allow uh, uh, any rooms uh, available in the end is because of the indifference of men. I think of tonight how often that I have been as a child, as God's child, how often I have been indifferent to the Holy Spirit. I want to say to you tonight 
That's not a proud thing that we can be indifferent. But many times we find that there are many concerns in our life that uh, makes us indifferent. It makes us indifferent to what God is trying to do with us and for us. So we consider that the indifferences that we have, how many times we come to church and we are simply indifferent with other people. How many uh, times we come to church and we are indifferent with our family members. We are indifferent to those that we are, uh, that we are uh, loving and, and trying to help and, and all of that. How much indifferences we have with one another. But can you see tonight that maybe this innkeeper was indifferent to the moving of the Holy Spirit. You see, uh, the Holy Spirit, he cries out with a shout from heaven. No, he speaks with a soft word. He speaks with a, uh, a, with a small, still, small voice. And today, you and I, perhaps we as God's people can be indifferent because we are ignoring that still, small voice. And the question would be, is there any room for Christ? Not only did we find in man's heart the ignorance and, uh, and the indifferences, but maybe tonight we would understand that they are simply too involved. We're too involved with other things around us. We're too involved with our own uh, uh, timekeeping. We're too involved with our own schedule to simply have not enough time to understand that God wants to use our life, the availabilities of our life, and he wants to use us in ways that we can minister to other people. And I think that tonight, how many times we are just too involved and to say, well, God, I don't have time for you. Well, I want to be able to go and minister to somebody. I would love to go and do a hospital visit. Or I'd love to be able to pray uh, for those that, uh, that need prayer. I would love to uh, be able to uh, 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 be a help in church or fix this or fix that. But oftentimes we find that all of our opportunities are being wasted because we're too involved in other things than for God. Many of us, we're too involved because we have no room for Christ. May I say to you tonight that it was no accident that all of this had happened. All of this has happened according to the prophecies. And, and uh, you know the prophecies, but we can, uh, we can turn over and we can look and we can find in the Bible. But all the prophecies state that in Isaiah chapter 53 gives us a real understanding that in these prophecies, in uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 53, verse uh, 3 through 5, the Bible says, He is despised and rejected a man a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we beheld, and, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him with his stripes. We are healed. May I say to you tonight that, uh, that today uh, that perhaps we are still living uh, in the areas that, that there's little room for Jesus. Now I ask you the question this morning, I mean tonight, I ask you the question, uh, what would bring the spirit of Christmas? What would it bring? Would it be giving? Would it be simply uh, that I would go and, and buy all these materialistic things and I'd give to every individual that I, uh, that I love, that I know, that I can correspond with? Would it be receiving? Well, I want to say to you tonight that tonight we find that perhaps having a Christmas spirit, having the spirit of Christmas is a simply having a room for Jesus Christ. Today, we still, we, I, we look into this mist of understanding and we see uh, the surroundings all around us that, uh, that birthdays and, and, and the, the Lord's birthday is simply uh, not 
Jesus' birthday, but, uh, but today uh, they want to try to call it a winter break. They want to try to call it a happy holiday. They want to try to call it any other thing but what it truly is, and that is a, an irreverent time that we are to acknowledge Jesus Christ as the Lord God, Savior of the world. I got it in my notes. At the very bottom of my notes, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. There's no room in the hearts of God's people to simply state that in, uh, in, in the areas of their life. But I want to say that. I want to put that out because I believe that uh, Christmas is not giving out the Christmas cards. I, I believe that uh, Christmas is not giving up the presents. Christmas is not even being kind. Christmas is not even, being, uh, even about praying for one another. Uh, Christmas is simply having room for Jesus. I want you to think of this tonight that some of the happiest times that we have in Christmas is not when we're doing all these things, but it's simply giving God place in our life. Well, I want you to consider this, this more, uh, tonight, uh, that uh, in our home we, uh, we've been trying to uh, teach our children because, let's just be honest, there's a great distraction when it comes to the heart of a child. When they see something wrapped up, they think, and, and if it has their name on it, uh, they know that that is a gift. And that attains to them and them only. And they know that they have a right to one day unwrap that gift and to enjoy uh, in the pleasures of spending time with that gift. They know uh, our children today, they understand, uh, and, and, and God bless the people at First Baptist Church, that there were some that uh, brought gifts and bags and, and had the names of children, and uh, they asked the question today, Daddy, can we open them tonight? I want you to know tonight, uh, today, that uh, I understand what a great challenge it is to the children of modern societies today. Uh, to understand that uh, there's a pull this way and there's a pull uh, that way. The world wants to pull them to believe in, a, uh, in, in something that is a myth, and yet God is trying to pull them uh, to, uh, to the uh, realities of what truth is and to have room in their heart for every individual. And so today, I understand that there's that pull uh, in a child's heart. But for you and I, it is our responsibility to teach them that there's a God in heaven and he, uh, he has the right to have room in our hearts. You say, what do you mean, preacher? I want you to know that tonight uh, that we can look into the Bible and we can understand what the Bible says. And uh, I think about we could, uh, even tonight, we could perhaps even quote uh, what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, where the Bible says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. We can understand that. And we can remember that Emmanuel means God with us. But may I say to you tonight that if you and I, we can understand what the Bible says in these areas, and we can know that the Bible teaches that God is with us, could we live a life to where there's really, even though we understand that, that there's no room for Christ? I want you to think of this tonight. Adrian Rogers quoted this. He stated, while the world has no room for Jesus, it won't always be that way. When he was here the first time, he stood before Pilate. When he comes again, Pilate will stand before him. When he came the first time, he came as a babe, uh, as a baby uh, in the manger. When he comes again uh, the second time, he will come as a king. 
When he came the first time, he was rejected. But our Lord says in Romans chapter 14, verse 11 and 12, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. There's no room for him now, but one of these days they'll say, Make room for the king. I want you to know today that the greatest thing, the greatest thing that we can have to attain in our life is to gain that spirit of Christ is simply giving our king room in our hearts. John chapter 1 verse 11 describes how people received him while he walked among them. While he walked in this world, John chapter 1 verse 11 states this, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Perhaps you are here today and would say, Preacher, that is not me. Perhaps you would say today, Preacher, I have room for Jesus in my heart. May I say to you tonight that uh, this may not apply to you, may not feel that like it applies to you, but tonight if you can say, like, Preacher, I have room for, my, uh, for Jesus. I have room for my Savior. He's my King. He's my Lord. And I know Him. And I am doing my best to walk with Him accordingly. Well, I'm glad for that. Amen? Because that's the kind of people we want, we need in our church. We need people in our church that simply uh, have made the decision that there's no more quarrel, there's no more second guessing, there's no more complication. There is simply a committed life simply saying that I am a born again believer. I know that I'm saved and I'm going to serve my king and I'm going to bring honor and glory to him because he is not just a king, but he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And one day you and I are going to stand before him to have an account of what we've done in our life. Is there any room for the king? May I say to you tonight, I want to encourage you to turn over me to John chapter 1. Because in John chapter 1 is where uh, I want to be able to bring out three things. If you're saved tonight, if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, there are three things that God has given to you and I, and I want to be able to give that to you. I pray that you would receive it as, a, uh, as what uh, we all have received, and that is the gift that Jesus Christ has given to you and I. Oh, I tell you right now, it's some of the greatest gifts. I tell you right now, I, I mean, it's an splendid gift. I mean, it's an extraordinary gift to know what God has given to you and I. I pray that you write it down. Mark it out in your Bible. Uh, describe to it. I mean, draw notes. I mean, draw an illustration to say uh, that this night on uh, December, uh, whatever day it is, 2019, this is where my preacher spoke the very truths of God and the reality of who Jesus Christ is. I want you to know this. Mark it out. John chapter 1, verse 12. Look with me. Three things that we're going to learn tonight. Number one. The Bible says, according to verse 12, but as many, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. May I say to you tonight, as a gift of Jesus Christ, one of the things that God has given to you I, is power to become his son or to become his daughter. And I want you to know that that is the greatest gift that today we are translated from darkness to light. We are no longer the, uh, the, the, uh, the child of the devil, but we are the children of an almighty God that the devil hates. <laughs> amen. Oh, I know he hates me, amen. And uh, I, I, I just got to be honest to you, amen. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know what God is doing. I don't know what God is allowing in my life. But I want you to know that God is simply trying to help me, trying to get me to understand. And he's asking, hey, preacher boy, is there any room for Jesus? 
Because if there is, you got power in your life. I want you to think about this power tonight. I mean, it is a power. I mean, I want you to consider that uh, for those that who are believing, I mean, uh, this power, uh, we can simply describe it such as this. Perhaps we could say it may be a right or it may be an authority. Uh, so we need to see that tonight this power is simply of an, an authority of an almighty God. <laughs> Amen. Uh, uh, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Boy, it's power that does not extinguish. Amen. Oh, how many times we question our salvation. How many times we say, well, Lord, hey, I, I know that there was a time that I surrendered. There was a time that I knelt before you. But, Lord, where are you today? Oh, because I need you, and you're not answering. I, I'm knocking. You're not, you're not being available. But yet we know, we know according to the Word of God that God has given us power because one day, uh, one day when we get over uh, our, our, these, uh, these weekly elements, one day we're shouting from the rooftop that there's a God in heaven that saves, and I'm glad for it. Amen. We think of this power uh, that's coming the child of God. I mean, uh, think about this. This amazing thought of being God's child. I mean, uh, Paul often made mention of it. He made mention of it. He said, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship. Boy, I tell you, I like that, amen. I, I like to know that God is still working on me. You know, that helps me in lonely times. You know, that helps me in depressing times. You know, that helps me through apathetical times. In other words, you're watching where people are disbelieving in God. Oh, that's more sickening than everything that I could ever understand where people... Say they love Jesus Christ, but there's no evidence of their love for him. I want to say to you tonight, we are his workmanship. According to verse two, uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. May I say to you tonight, there is no merit of salvation of your own. If you're saved tonight, you are simply saved by grace. That grace has given you the attainability to be saved. I'm not saved by what good works I've done. I am saved by what Christ done on the cross. He had made that attainability uh, for me. To be saved, <laughs> not any merit in me, but all the merit, all the credit goes to Jesus Christ. Grace is bestowed through faith. Romans 3, 24, the Bible says, uh, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Freely given to all those that are willing to, uh, to receive him. May I say to you tonight, God's power cannot be manifested into an individual's life until they give their heart over to him. Tonight, I'm a child of the king. It's hard to, hard to understand that sometimes because I know the individual I am. I know when I look up in the mirror you filthy, rotten, no good sinner. I understand that. But the Bible teaches that he gives power to those who believe to become sons of God. When we come under the Almighty for the change of ownership and God gives us power over the devil, the devil would do anything and everything to produce fear in your life that you and I are not God's child. Let me, let me describe this to you tonight. See, 
uh, the devil, he wants you to attribute to his abilities. He wants you to attribute honor to him. He wants you to think that he is in second command when the devil is limited at what he does, at what he says, and at what he believes. I want you to think of this tonight. Satan is unlike God. God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. God is omniscient. He can be in every place and every moment at every time of the day. Can you imagine that? God's over there. Hey, God's over here. Hey, God is right there. Hey, God is right here. He's right there. He's right. He's everywhere. Can you imagine tonight that here Satan wants you to believe that he can be there, he could be in two places at once. And yet, we succumb to that. But yet, we see that, we think that, uh, that well, oh, I, I better walk a tight rope because if I fall, if I fall, I, 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 I might just fall out and I'm not going to be able to get up. I was listening to a sermon this past week. And uh, uh, the preacher preached this. He was preaching about eternal security, about uh, how the Old Testament brought it out in the book of Noah. And I just want to give this to you because I think it was a great illustration. And I, I'm uneducated. Amen. <laughs> and, I, and when I get a little nugget, I love it. Amen. And it helps me. But, uh, but the preacher was stating that uh, in Noah's ark, uh, in the book of Genesis, it describes uh, the eternal security. And, and, and what it is is that uh, in the emphasis, and I'll bring this out uh, in the upcoming days, but in the emphasis, it was bringing it out uh, that, uh, that Noah was there. And, uh, and, 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 uh, and the verses describe that Noah, uh, Noah come into the ark, Right? And so for that to be able to happen, and, and the preacher described that for Noah to be able to, uh, to hear that voice to say, come in, Noah, right, had to be that which we know it was God that was inside the ark. And, and, and Noah, Noah, come in the ark, come in unto the ark. I want to say to you tonight that uh, there's, uh, that gives a description that God was not on side of the ark because he didn't say, Noah, go into the ark and I'll take care of the rest. What he did say, Noah, come into the ark and I will shut the door. God shut the door of the ark. Therefore, there was no way of opening it. There was no way of closing it. You and I need to see that salvation is only by God. For by grace are you saved. It is not for you and I. Uh, it is by God that we're saved. It is his power that the Bible describes. But as many as received him to, gave, uh, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So Satan is unlike God. Satan is not all-powerful. He is not all-knowing. He is not in every place at every moment. Not only that we find that, but we find that Satan is not an equal with God, but he is a subordinate to God. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Well, I'm glad you asked because I had to look that word up. I want to make sure what I was preaching. Subordinate means a person under the authority or control of another in an organization. So he gets, Satan gets his, if I would say this properly, and I want to say this clearly, but Satan gets his commands from God. You say, well, preacher, what do you mean? Well, uh, we know that Satan, he wants us to think that he is equal with God. And uh, because we get that illustration in Isaiah where he stated in his mind, in his heart, that I'm going to be like the Most High. Today, you and I, we struggle with that because Satan wants you and I to take that same understanding and we, he wants us, he did it with Adam and Eve. Being in a place of perfection, he did it with Adam and Eve, and he was able to ruin mankind for a time. That's what makes Jesus 
so beautiful because he comes and redeems that time. And so Satan is not an equal. Satan cannot tempt you without God's permission. Job chapter 1, verse 12, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is thy power, only upon him put not forth thy hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Satan cannot touch you without God's permission. I like that, amen. You ever, uh, you ever been, uh, when you were a little kid, I know you, Brother Ron, I'd probably, probably a lot of light, but you, you get into the, uh, uh, the fight and, you know the teacher's over there, and so you want to challenge God, and you, touch me, man, I'll, I'll, boy, I'll knock you out, right? You know it ain't going to touch you. The teacher's standing right there watching, man. You, you, you go right ahead, man. I don't want you to know tonight, you and I, we, uh, we have power. We have power uh, that Satan can't touch you and I without God's permission, amen? But we, but we take it the opposite, right? Satan, he understands that. But he comes up to us, boy, I'll, boy, I'll, I'll take you out. See, he does the opposite. Here's what the Bible's saying. Look with me in John chapter 1, verse 12. Look what the Bible says. But as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. I want you to know tonight that uh, Satan is trying to use a uh, mind manipulation. He wants you to know that he has power over you, but he has no power unless he gets it from God. And so tonight we need to see that Satan uh, can't do anything to us without God's permission. Satan cannot even influence nature without God's permission. Uh, according to Job chapter 1, verse 16, the Bible says, While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. You know, Satan is a very great emic of what God does. We know that Elijah called fire from heaven and, uh, and yet we find that uh, fire came from, uh, from heaven, and we know it wasn't God because we know that this servant came, and he came speaking uh, these truths to Job, describing that perhaps it might have been. Satan wants you to believe that it was God, but it was not God. Because you could study out that and you can find uh, one by one and, and go through all of that, that Satan gave Satan permission. And so tonight we need to see that Satan cannot even influence the weather unless God permits it. Satan cannot influence nature without God permitting it. Well, I'll tell you right now, I've been working with a few guys on the side here and there, and uh, the guy has a, 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 a house that he bought, and uh, it, for me, I would just gut the whole house. It was just that way. And they wanted me to go down underneath the house and work. Wait a minute now. There's a limitation. Amen? There's a limitation. There's only a limitation what I'll do, and uh, I don't go up underneath houses. I'm a roofer. I stay on top. Amen? I don't go up underneath the houses, amen. And uh, I didn't have to say that. I just, uh, I just kind of kept backing away. Won't you go up underneath there? Hey, you go on. Hey, uh, uh, listen, I want you to know tonight uh, that uh, uh, I, I'm not the one to get up underneath the, uh, uh, the house and to be with some hidden snake or, or some little uh, freaky spider, amen. We don't do those things, amen. That's why you stay on top. You can see everything, amen. I mean, something comes after you, and, uh, and, and which it will. It could, you know. I mean, we've been up on the roof, and birds try to come flying at us and all, and, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, I've been eaten up by mosquitoes and all, but, hey, you can hear them. You can see them coming. And the guy was telling me, yeah, I had a spider crawling up on my leg. I said, see there? That's why I don't go underneath there, amen. I, 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 there's... there's Listen, there's a limitation, amen? But folks, we need to know tonight that Satan is limited. He's limited in what he can do. He cannot hurt you physically without God's permission. 
Job chapter two and three, uh, chapter two, verse two and three. The Bible says, "And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou?" And Satan answered the Lord and said, "From going to and fro in the earth, from walking up and down in it." And the Lord said unto Satan, "Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feared God and escheweth evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause." Satan cannot harm you without God's permission. But may I ask you tonight, if God had considered Job, maybe we need to see that why he considered Job. Maybe he had considered Job because there was room in Job's heart. Job was filled with the things of God. Job was uh, conscious about God. And, and, and listen, you can study out the Job, uh, uh, the incidents, and you can understand that all these, uh, all these things that came upon him, that his uh, children uh, being uh, killed and all his possession and everything that he owned got taken away from him in one day's time. And the Bible says that in all of that, he did not curse God. I want to know tonight, if God sought in you some integrity, would you and I find in our hearts that there's no room and we would just wound up cursing God? Is there any room for Christ? I want to move on tonight if I could. But John chapter 1, if you will look with me again. John chapter 1, we already read verse 12. But as many as receive him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. In verse 13, the Bible says, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. I want to say to you tonight that God produces an ultimate change in your life when you give your heart to him. To become a child of God in a physical sense, one must be born so also it is to become a child of God, one must have that second birth. Born of blood. Notice what the Bible says. Born of blood. Born of blood simply means that a person does not become a Christian through having Christian parents. Salvation is not passed down from generation to generation. Salvation is not passed down through the bloodstream. Salvation is not passed down by an descendant. Salvation is not passed down through an inheritance. Salvation is only given the right to an individual when they truly believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Born not of blood. Second of all, born of uh, not of the will of flesh. Notice what the Bible says in verse 13. Uh, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh. Uh, born of the will of flesh is that a person does not have the power in his own flesh to produce the new birth. He must be willing in order to be saved, and yet uh, it is nothing in him that can save him, but only his decision to receive Jesus Christ as his atonement for his sin. And so we find uh, born not by blood, not born not by the will of flesh, and third of all, born nor of the will of man. And so the born of the will of man simply uh, is that no other man can save you. Think of that tonight. How many times we have heard preachers preach uh, sermons on salvation and no preacher for any incidents, for any anxiety, for any, uh, any other reason, no man can save another individual. We may be able to tell them how to be saved, but the faith of another individual cannot save a person. I think of my children. I think about how uh, 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 two of them had already received Christ uh, according to their profession, not according to my profession, because I can't save them. If I could, I would. I have that desire for my children to be saved. I have that desire for my children to be in heaven. But 
For them to have that new birth, they must choose Jesus Christ. And so we find, uh, uh, according to the Bible, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of God, uh, w- will of man. But notice what the Bible says. But of God. When the Bible describes that you and I were born by the will of God, it simply identified that you were planned by design. When God hung on that cross, He thought about you and I. When God hung on that cross, here's here's the story. Here's the understanding. Here's the reality. When God thought about you on the cross, he had room for you in his heart. You saying, preacher, what do you mean? Well, according to John chapter 14, the Bible gives an understanding of the room that Jesus Christ had. John chapter 14, the Bible said, uh, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. God had room for you. And so tonight we find that salvation uh, uh, by God, by the will of God, simply is that God designed uh, from the very beginning to save you. But I like this fact. And I like this fact because a lot of people struggle with this, but the idea of it is that God had designed not just for you, those that are saved, but for every, every individual in all the world, God had room for them in his heart. Therefore, it is to every believer that he or she renews her faith, renews their desire, renews their understanding of God's will according to God's way. And so that's why we go uh, and we read the Bible because we want to learn God's will. What is God's will for my life? I asked that question many times before. What is God's will for my life? I mean, I, I, I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to do that. What is God's will for my life? Well, here's what was taught for me. To know God's will, you must be able to do what God has already told you. And that is uh, what was told to me, that there was four things. Number one, go to church. Number two, read your Bible. Number three, pray. Number four, witness to others. You do those four things, and God will show you his will. You mean, what do you mean his will? I mean, he will direct you the bible says that he directs a good man's ways he will direct you to where we call the will of god he will direct you to where he wants you to be and uh he will show you how to do it Uh, i remember when me and my wife and my family first came here and uh one of the greatest fears was that uh lord i'm not sure that i can pastor a church because i have never done it Here was the understanding that God gave me. You go, because it's not about you. (laughs) Amen? It's not about you. And and he goes, you just learn to obey what I tell you to do, and I'll show you, I'll explain it to you, I'll tell you how to do it, and you just follow my instructions, and you'll get it done. Boy, I've been doing that for five years. And uh, uh, today... Uh, I'm, I'm grateful. God is beginning to expand my faith. By, God is beginning to, uh, uh, to show me in a greater way, a, a, a greater picture of what he has wanting to accomplish in our lives. And so if a change is going to come about, it would be through, yes, a willingness of a heart to want to be able to change, but may I say to you that there's no change that, come, can, that can come about until the heart has room for Christ. We must be able to have room 
Tonight, Psalms 110, verse, uh, verse 3, the Bible says, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, thou hast to do of thy youth. Uh, I want you to know that today, if you and I are going to have change in our life, there must be a willingness to change. You say, preacher, what do you mean? A willingness to change. I mean a willingness to do the will of God in my life. Sometimes, I've been teaching our children, it's better to obey than it is to live in disobedience. Man, I wish that I was more proficient in describing that to my children because sometimes it's hard to come home and have to discipline them for their actions. But I want you to know tonight, you and I, we are simply not born, uh, according to verse 13, we're not born, uh, not of blood, nor the will of, uh, of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but we are, as Christians, we are to be born in the will of God. We know that is God's will for us to save us, but you know what? God has a great will that he saved you for. And I want you to know tonight, the only way that you and I can accomplish his will is not through disobedience. It is simply through obedience. And then uh, go with me, if you would, John chapter 1, verse uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 16, and we'll get to the last point. We'll go home. Uh, we're right there on time schedule. So look with me. The Bible says in Romans, uh, I mean, John chapter 1, uh, verse 16, the Bible says, And of his fullness have we all received and grace for grace. May I say to you tonight, uh, according to the word of God, uh, we've seen three things here. Number one, that is power to become sons of God. Number two, uh, born to the will of God. And then number three, the reception of Christ's fullness. Get what the Bible says here. And of his fullness have we all received. Tonight, all who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ receives a supply of spiritual strength for, uh, out of his uh, fullness. We receive those spiritual strengths out of God's fullness. Amen. His fullness is so great that he can provide spiritual strength to every believer in all countries, uh, in all ages, in every moment, in every, uh, in every day. God is a God, all power in God. He is a resourceful God. He never runs dry. He never gets weary. He never gets tired. And yet we see that this God, this God of heaven, is the one God that you and I today, if we're saved, is to serve. And the only way that we can serve him is by having room for him. Jesus stated that if we abide in him, then we can attain his fullness. Uh, John chapter 15, verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. I don't know about you, but you ever been half full? You ever wake up in the morning and be like, man, I, I, I don't know. I just don't feel right. You get that emptiness? Discouraging, isn't it? May I say to you tonight, according to the word of God, you and I, if we abide in Christ and he abides in us, we can ask. There's not one thing that we have to lack of. There's not one thing that has to torment us. There's not one thing that we can fall short of. We can go to Jesus and we can give everything to Jesus. We can tell him all of our troubles and he will see simply fulfill us. He will give us that fullness. All believers' fullness simply comes. When we let go of our pride and begin to see our need in looking to Jesus and praying to Jesus. Luke chapter 11, verse 9 and 10, the Bible says, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh, receiveth, and he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. This type of fullness that God wants to give you through Christ simply is this. The Greek word of fullness is polormo, uh, which denotes a definition of a totality of divine powers and 
attributes. And Christ uh, and God saw it fit to give all of that to Jesus Christ. Look with me in John chapter uh, 1, verse 14. The Bible says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. By Jesus Christ, this fullness was imparted to the church, which is His body. That's why we emphasize here uh, that we are to walk according to the Scriptures. Uh, yeah, go with me real quick. Ephesians, real quick. We're almost done. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And, look, and, and I want you to see here this fullness to where you and I are at. Is there any room for Christ? Ephesians chapter 1. Look with me and start reading in verse 17. The Bible reads here in verse 17 of chapter 1 of Ephesians. That, uh, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the which to come uh, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head of all things to the church, which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all. You get that? That filleth all in all. May I say to you tonight, you and I simply can be full of Christ's fullness. But for that to happen, there must be room for him. Tonight, the Christmas spirit is not giving, is not receiving, the Christmas spirit is when you and I have room for him. Every head bowed, every eyes closed as we go to the Father. Heavenly Father, as we come to you tonight, dear God, we ask him, Father, that as the song leaders come and prepare uh, uh, an invitation time, we ask, dear God, that you would strengthen us and help us to understand that this fullness, dear God, uh, you have given to us uh, when we have understand that, there should be room for you in our hearts.